get this thing showing up for you. So thanks for joining. Uh, go ahead and let me know where you guys are calling in from. Uh, we've got Japan, Australia, UK, Canada, America, so and local Seattle here. So I just want to see where a few of you guys are coming from and uh, say thank you for coming. And as we all know, and I've said in many, many times before, that SNPs are coming into your office all the time, i.e. patients with them, and we need to know where to start because it's an amazing tool when it's used effectively. We're still learning how to approach them, but uh, we're not doing it quite right. I think it'll take us some time to quite figure it out. But uh, yeah, we got Singapore today, Smoky Santa Rosa. Sorry to hear that. that uh, we are in, if you go east of the mountains here of Seattle, there's Wenatchee and it's very smoky there. Tourism is hurting. Uh, guess who? Hey, Jess, good to see you, man. Uh, Pittsburgh, Chicago, Florida. Man, that's got to be sticky and hot. Denver, awesome. Andy, thanks for coming. And uh, we hope to see you here in October in a couple months, 50 some days away until ShyCon comes along. So let's get right to it. There's a lot to talk about. And uh, I have the fortunate honor of having Dr. Paul Anderson come over to hang out and, and uh, have some dinner. And I want to see that guy on a paddleboard. So, uh, I hope to get some pictures of that. So Paul will be presenting with us in ChiCon 15, doing a great case study. So all you guys can hear me just fine. Um, nice, Florida. Yeah, thanks, pharmacist Rick. Hood River, gorgeous. I bet you kiteboard or windsurf. So Q&A. So what I want to let you guys know is I want to give you some basic fundamentals of SNPs and where I focus uh, and how I use them clinically and how I've learned doctors utilize them effectively. Because what I do now is I don't have a practice, as many of you know, so because my, my time is spent making pathways and understanding and making the connections uh, because doctors are coming to me with a bunch of questions. And I feel my job is to provide you some answers and resolutions. Yeah, I had this person with MTHFR 677 come into my clinic, gave methylfolate, amazing, life changed. Next day, I had a patient with MTHFR 677 coming to my clinic. I gave methylfolate. They started sobbing right on the spot. What the heck? I gave some kid with MTHFR 677 some methylfolate. He started beating up his parents. Why? So it's because we are treating one gene. So let me focus on this and uh, I'm gonna go to this simplified diagram because what I've found out is I tend to get a little overboard and a little too far ahead of myself. So I think what we need to do is establish a foundation first and we need to talk about genes and what they do and how they work and how they don't work. So first we have a gene and a lot of genes job is to make enzymes. Not all genes make enzymes, but a lot of genes make enzymes. And it's the enzymes which do work. And genes are obviously made out of DNA that we get from our mom and dad, and they can be modified. And if they get modified, then uh, it might be a SNP, right? Single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, which I'll get into in a second. But they can be modified. But let's say there's a perfectly normal gene. We've got a perfectly normal gene, and it makes a perfectly normal enzyme, okay? But it needs tools in order to do work. I've got a wheelbarrow sitting in my garage and I've got a lawnmower sitting in my garage, but that dang lawnmower and the wheelbarrow are not going to work themselves. They need assistance. And I'm trying to train my kids to be an assistant. So thankfully my oldest boy mowed the lawn today. So thank you, Tasman, for that. So, but they need work. They need to be able to do something. And genes and enzymes, if there's nothing there for them to do, they're not going to work. They're going to be quiet and turned off. Now I'll say there is work to be done. Say there's tall grass here, and the lawnmower needs to be cutting it now that we have a nice finished lawn. So in order for the gene and the enzyme to work, it needs some fuel to come in. And that fuel can be a variety of different things. It could be methionine, it could be homocysteine, it could be urea, it could be, uh, geez, it could be testosterone, it could be a lot of different things, estrogen. So these things come in here, it could be arsenic. So something comes in, 
And that gene has then turns it into a finished product. But genes make enzymes, right? So the substrate comes in, the, the enzyme can't just make an end product by itself. Typically, typically they need something. Some enzymes can work by themselves without any cofactors, but a lot of them do need it. And what's a cofactor? A cofactor is what binds to the necessary enzyme in order for that enzyme to say, oh, okay, you've got me focused. Now I can do some work here. And a key enzyme to be focused on is MTHFR, but we'll get that to that in a second. So a cofactor makes the enzymes work. If that cofactor isn't there, then that enzyme is not going to function. So imagine a locked door or you've got your car door and it's locked from the inside and you try to lift it and it doesn't do anything. You're there, you're the substrate, your hand is the substrate, the enzyme is the car ha door handle, but it's locked. So your key is the cofactor, which unlocks it, which in the end product is an open door for you to get into your car. Now, increasing activity possibly uh, it could be many things, but increasing activity of the enzyme can be due to many, many factors. And these could be environmental, they could be neurotransmitter, they could be chemical, they could be, uh, oh, geez, um, you know, other products uh, in the biochemical pathways. So many, many different things can increase the activity of an enzyme. Now, on the flip side, there's a lot of things that can decrease the activity. So we know a lot about feedback inhibition, right? So if you make a lot of, say, SAME, the body is going to say, whoa, we've got enough SAME, stop making it. So then it's going to come back and it's going to tell the enzyme to stop working. So it's going to decrease the activity. It's regulated. So we need to have regulation. If we don't have regulation, then we could have, we'd have a bunch of stuff being produced. And that bunch of stuff being produced would be utilizing up a bunch of cofactors and a bunch of substrate, and we possibly wear out of these things, or we'd have too much of them, say of, of uh, you know, say dopamine. If you're, if you're cranking out a bunch of dopamine without any regulation, then you would probably never sleep, and you'd probably be very, very productive, but you probably wouldn't live very long because you'd be worked out uh, past your capacity. So uh, you guys, can you see my screen here? You should be able to see this visual. Nope, nope, are you serious? Okay, let me uh, see what's going on here. Sorry about that, I'm glad I checked that. Let me see the control panel. Oh, there's a button to show my screen. There, how's that? You don't wanna see my face, my face is boring. All right, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, still learning. I'm a doctor, I'm not an IT dude. All right, yeah, tech guru, thanks, Anthony. All right, so we talked about substrate going into the gene, right? We got end product here. We have things which make the enzyme go faster. We have things that make the enzyme go slower. And we have things that make the enzyme work in the first place, such as cofactors. So we're all good with that, okay? So let's give an example. Increasing activity would be, for example, if, uh, well, let's do the car door example. If you are going to your car and it's in the evening and you see a coyote running after you, I think you're going to be running pretty quick, right? So you're going to want to unlock that dang door as fast as you can. So that environmental factor of a coyote sitting in the, well, actually running after you is going to increase your ability to open that door, or maybe even decrease your ability. So there's things in the environment which affect that ability for that door to open or close, okay? So let's go to the next slide here. Here's a real example. So here's an example that's a, it's a snippet from the pathway planner, which is a big biochemical nightmare for some people. And for others, it's an amazing clinical tool when you know how to use it appropriately. And I'm still learning how to use it as well. So let's look in a, a very common gene here. I know there's a lot of questions surrounding CVS. But I think this gene is a lot more important to discuss because it is this methionine synthase enzyme which really regulates methylation along with MTHFR. Now you would think I'd probably use MTHFR here. 
because I'm kind of the MTHFR guy, but I want you guys to know that I, I do other things besides MTHFR. Now, MTR is a key regulatory enzyme in methylation, and there are polymorphisms in it. There are SNFs in MTR, which make it go slow, and some of them go faster, but and some we don't know yet, and some have no change. So there is a known SNP for MTR, which slows it down, and I'm not going to bother with the details on that. What I'm going to let you know is that it does exist, and the clinical research does show that MTR is, in fact, slowed down with this specific SNP. Okay? So if this enzyme here is slowed down, then you would think that homocysteine would increase, right? Because homocysteine is the substrate needed for MTR to work, and the end product is methionine. So in order for MTR to work, you need to have adequate homocysteine. So if your patient has low homocysteine or they're not eating adequate protein, say that maybe they're a vegan or a vegetarian or a carbitarian because all they do is eat carbs all day, then their homocysteine levels are going to be too low and it won't fuel the MTR. Or if their homocysteine levels are not high enough, it's also not going to fuel the MTR and they can't make adequate methionine. So regardless if the SNP is here or not, if the patient's homocysteine is too low, it doesn't matter if they have a SNP. Now, let's talk about another factor. Another factor is the cofactor. It's a poet. Yeah. Anyway, so you need zinc, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, otherwise known as methylfolate, and methylcobalamin. You need these three things to help support the MTR enzyme to do work. So again, if your patient is B12 deficient for countless reasons, they're methylfolate deficient for countless reasons. They're not eating their leafy greens or they have folate polymorphisms upstream in their biochemistry, or they have zinc deficient deficiency because of uh, poor absorption or bacteria in the gut or who knows what. And maybe they're not getting adequate methylcobalamin because they can't absorb it, they can't carry it. Uh, maybe they're binding protein, which carries your patient's methylcobalamin to the cell and gets it into the cell. It uses glutathione. So if your patient's glutathione is low, Transcobalamin cannot transport B12 to the cell. So here we are focusing on MTR as a SNP, but your patient's B12 is low. And not only that, you give them the B12 and there's no really improvement. Maybe their transcobalamin levels aren't working, or maybe their transcobalamin levels aren't uh, high enough for various other reasons. Maybe there's a genetic polymorphism upstream for that. So what I'm saying is, when you get your genetic reports and your SNP reports for your patients, and you're looking at these long diagrams, some of them 40-some pages long, and it shows MTR, and it gives some SNP next to it, and it says decrease function, and you're focusing on that SNP, then, and you're not looking at the homocysteine, you're not looking at the zinc or the methylfolate or the methylcobalamin, and then you're, let's go in the step over here. Now we have a bunch of things that look at what slows it down. Well, we know the SNP does, but what else slows it down? There's epigenetics. Epigenetics are what control the genes, right? Epigenetics are the environment, the lifestyle, the diet. And someone at the UK conference, I asked, what does environment mean? Because sometimes you say words and you know who knows what they mean. So I asked, what does environment mean? And people said water and, and food and air and all these things. And somebody said, anything that's not you. It's like, wow, that's beautifully said. So anything that is not us is kind of the environment. So anything that is not us can affect our enzymes, not including us as well. But nitric oxide, we all think it's a great thing, and it is in adequate doses. Then we have lead, mercury, hydrogen peroxide, which uses, uh, which helps get rid of bacteria and viruses and in our in our bodies, which is great, it's needed, but too much is a problem. And uh, we need glutathione and catalase to get rid of that. Then you have acetaldehyde, which comes from what? Yeast overgrowth, i.e. candida, also comes from alcohol ingestion. So we see fetal alcohol syndrome in pregnancy, right? So we can't drink alcohol during pregnancy and we shouldn't. And I don't even agree with women drinking wine during pregnancy because that alcohol is turning into acetaldehyde and it's inhibiting or slowing their activity. I don't want to say 
inhibiting anymore. I want to say slowery, s slowing activity. So yeast overgrowth, alcohol intake, slow the activity of this enzyme. So does nitric oxide, which you get from where? The dentist. And pre-surgical, uh, pre-major surgery, also they'll use nitrous oxide to calm the patients down. High SAMe, this should all be capitalized, but my graphic designer is not a biochemist. No worries, Sean, we did this quickly. Um, so high SAM, elevated SAM, is also going to turn down MTR. Because if your patient has adequate methylation going on, then MTR doesn't need to work in the first place. And then inflammation, TNF-alpha, also slows MTR. So again, if we focus only on the SNP, we don't look at the epigenetic controls, then we're going to be doing a patient's a disservice. Now, what speeds this up? I know that low SAMe will speed up MTR. So if your patients don't have adequate SAMe, it's going to tell MTR to work faster. Now, when would this be useful? When would SNPs be useful to look at? After you've evaluated homocysteine, methionine, how their epigenetics are doing, and how their general overall nutrition is going, okay? Only then do you start looking at the SNPs. Say you've done, if you looked at all of these issues here, you've applied them all. Then you say, you know, you're still not quite right. You're just not, you're just not getting enough SAMe in your system. You're not, we're not able to lower your homocysteine fast enough. It's just resistant. You have a family history of cardiovascular disease, and we're not able to get your homocysteine downs, and we're giving you methylfolate. And we've, we know you don't have lead or mercury. The yeast overgrowth is, is nailed down. The, your inflammation is controlled. Uh, you've got adequate glutathione. And you're eating and absorbing your protein. So, but you're still not quite right. And maybe we should give you more nutrients. And let's see what your genetics are doing. And it turns out that, yeah, in fact, your patient does have a slow MTR enzyme. So in this situation, you would possibly... We're looking at one gene now only, you would possibly increase these nutrients to make it work harder. And you would be very, very adamant to tell them, say, hey, you cannot drink alcohol. You just can't drink alcohol right now. So because it really slows your already slowed MTR enzyme down. You are genetically predisposed to elevated homocysteine because your MTR enzyme is, is, is too slow because of this polymorphism. So we need to prevent you from going to the dentist and getting nitrous oxide. We need to keep your inflammation at bay. We need to make sure you're not eating uh, salmon or tuna or, or farmed fish or eating paint or, or getting mercury amalgams and making sure that your, your bacterial uh, and viral infections are kept at bay. So, and these things we, you have to keep in mind and inform your patient and say, look, you are genetically predisposed to having elevated homocysteine because this one particular enzyme is not working very quickly. So let's make some lifestyle changes and some nutritional changes in your situation. Now, to go back to get on a rant that I did at a, at a prior, in fact, I'm at my last month's webinar, which was actually a couple of weeks for some of you, Somebody asked me about these programs. I don't say names, uh, but these programs where you plug in your, your patient's raw data, okay? You plug in your patient's raw data from, your 20, from their 23andMe report, and they, they run it, and they get the raw data, and then they say, okay, now what? So and then you go to these various websites, and they run these reports, and some of these reports are giving nutritional recommendations, so in this situation with MTR, say there's an MTR polymorphism in, on this particular report for your patient, and the recommendation is to give more methylcobalamin, right? Well, is the report saying anything about the lifestyle factors? Are they saying anything about having adequate homocysteine? Are they saying anything about uh, adequate zinc or methylfolate? Are they saying, are they looking at other genes as well? Are they looking at the patient's history and lifestyle? No. So what these reports are doing is they're trying to simplify medicine and they're trying to shill supplements. Yes, I own a supplement company, but is, it is my job to hold utmost integrity and it's my job to have your clinical outcomes the best that they can be. 
because I want to optimize your patient's life and I want to optimize your clinical success because your clinical success translates to better outcomes for your patient, makes your job more enjoyable, allows you to be more passionate about what you do. And it also allows you to do your job a lot easier. And it's, it's fun to do things right. It's not fun to do things half-assed. I hate it. It drives me freaking crazy. So when these, these reporting companies come in and they're, they want to make your job easier, I understand that. But you can't make the job easier when it's the wrong thing to do. It's our job to clinicians in the field such as yourself, and thank you for being here and wanting to learn this and apply it because this is an upcoming already present field but it's not done properly. There are supplement companies, again, I don't name names, that will look at your patient's genetic profile and they'll recommend their supplements based upon the SNPs. And they're not evaluating history, lifestyle, diet, and all these other things. So it's, it's, it's really problematic. And I, I assure you that what's going to happen to these supplement companies who are making these recommendations based upon SNPs and polymorphisms and the doctors say, oh, this is great. This is making my job so much easier because now I can follow these genetic recommendations for my patients, MTHFR, their COMT, their MAUE, their DAO, their MTR, and I can give these set of supplements and I can prescribe them and I can go to the next patient. You've got a recipe for success. Boom, backfire. <laughs> You're going to be very, very frustrated. Your parents, your pa parents, your parents will be pissed too. Your patients are going to be pissed at you because they're not going to get better. They went to you because you're a genetics expert and you could be a genetics expert, but you're also an expert in basic environmental medicine and family medicine, functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, whatever medicine that looks at the whole person. So we'll call it holistic medicine. MDs, NDs, DCs, RN, it doesn't matter what your initials are after your name, as long as you're applying and thinking of Tolcosm and, you know, treating the whole person and do no harm. Okay, so soapbox aside, the way you approach SNPs is the way you've been treating your patients from day one. This is another tool. I have a pencil here. Okay, a pencil is a tool. I don't always use this pencil. Sometimes I use pens, sometimes I use crayons, sometimes I use computers. It's another tool. And I don't, uh, the patient's genetics are yet another tool that we have. And it gets overwhelming when we have a bunch of tools, but it's also very, very powerful when you know how to use the right ones. My garage is full of tools. I used to do landscape design and construction. I've got a whole slew of them. I've got jigsaws, bandsaws, chop saws. Uh, mowers, weed eaters, uh, cut, you know, paver uh, cutters, water saws, you name it, electrical supplies, irrigation supplies. But I use the different tools for the different jobs for the different clients. So SNPs should be used. When do you use SNPs? I like to use SNPs when you want to optimize the outcome of your patient, when you want to optimize pregnancy. When you are doing all the environmental, lifestyle, diet, nutritional interventions, and you're stuck, you're seeing weird reactions in your patients, you're not getting anywhere. You see a long family history of depression or any type of con medical condition in your patient. You ask family history, aunts, uncles, grandfathers, great grandparents, mothers, sisters, brothers, okay? If you look at the family history and you see cardiovascular disease or neurovascular or neurological problems or, you know, what have you, any consistent pattern, right, or chemical toxicity or what have you, or skin diseases, asthmas, then, yeah, there's, there's probably some genetic control here and you got to look at that. So that's when you use SNPs. Okay, so you do everything that you already know. And then you bring in the SNPs to it. And I really also like to use SNPs when I want to increase compliance of your patient outcome. Because when you do a genetic test on your patient and you show that they have MTR, you show that they have MTHFR or COMT, and now you can say, hey, look, 
you have this genetic polymorphism here, makes this enzyme slow, you're at risk for elevated homocysteine, you got a lifestyle history of cardiovascular disease from like far back as you can think of, and you're, you're sucking down three, four beers a night, and you got mercury amalgams in you, and you're, you know, you're, you're staying up late all hours, and you're inflamed, your TNF alpha is elevated, you got to stop. You are at risk. You are at risk. And so they see this and they say, God, you know, that they, they, they look at their friends who are sucking down beers and they're fine. They drink the beers and they don't feel good. You give them supplements to overcome that. And those supplements are right here. You give them these cofactors to speed up the homocysteine elimination or recycling and they feel better. But these lifestyle and dietary and environmental factors are also slowing this activity down. So you can modify their lifestyle and dietary activities and really make an impact. And once you do that, then their nutritional load is going to go down. Say, you know, doc, I can't afford supplements. They're too expensive. Well, then stop buying alcohol because that's also too expensive. So you stop doing the alcohol, then you don't need as much supplementation. So let me show you an example here. So SNPs, it's really all about the capacity to do work. Genes, it's all about the capacity to do work. So you've got MTHFR, it makes methylfolate. And MTHFR, if you have one 677 variant, then you have a 40% reduction in function, okay? Now, if you have two, now you have a 70% reduction in function. That means you have a 30% capacity of that MTHFR enzyme to do work, Okay, there's, so there's 30% still available to do work if you have MTHFR 677T variant. There's still 30% working. It's not like it's, it's not working at all. If it's not working at all, you're dead. You're literally dead. That's why these are so, so rare, having a homozygous 1298 and a single uh, AC and vice versa. I've never seen a double-double. Has anybody seen a double 677 and a double 1298 in a patient? Anybody? Really, Rohan? You've seen a homozygous 677TT and a homozygous CC in a patient? See. Okay, she was schizophrenic. <laughs> I bet. I bet. I bet she was a lot more than that. But uh, yeah, that must have been a tough case. So, anyhow, I'm personally compound heterozygous. So, this is me, okay? And I cannot tolerate alcohol. I had yeast overgrowth. I was a sugarholic because I was stressed out. And so I was stressed out and I would, I would burn my glucose from the stress. And so I'd eat more sugar and I was on this, this up and down cycle. And I felt like just crap and I couldn't tolerate alcohol and so on. So my alcohol intake has gone way down. So, so on. But my point is here, I still have a 30% capacity I eat my leafy greens. I don't drink alcohol. I don't have yeast overgrowth. I feel great. I feel great. Now, the more you put strain on the enzyme, the more nutrient, the more cofactor is needed. So let's look at empty Jafar. If I have a beer, yeah, I've ate some leafy greens. I'm good to go, right? I can process a beer. Now, if I got a keg and I'm just going to town, now I've got issues. Okay, so this is going to be a big problem. So you got to be very careful about understanding what genes do and how you approach them. So I hope that is a good basics for you guys on how to approach SNPs. Think of it as capacity to do work because they're not shut down. Just because you have MTHFR doesn't mean it's shut down. It means that there's still capacity. Now, let me also bring up a fact where you've got... Um, there's a video on YouTube that's got almost like 100,000 views. I think if you go to mtjavar.net, yeah, if you go to mtjavar.net, I end that talk. If you want to go to the very end of that conference presentation, it's actually a webinar, there's a paper that I cite. And I wanted to bring it here, but I didn't have time. I got pulled away. Sorry. But it looked at the increased prevalence of neural tube defects in patients who are homozygous mtjavar677. Americans, Chinese, and Hispanics have neural tube defects, 
and it's heavily, heavily associated with MTHFR 677 homozygous. Now, if you go over to Italy, they also have very high prevalence for MTHFR 677T homozygous variant, but their neural tube defects not associated. Why? Why? Environment, beautiful weather, family oriented, good diet, and lower stress. They get a month of paid vacations. Americans, Hispanics, and the Chinese, we work like crazy. Japanese work like crazy. So we need to tone it down. We all need to move to Italy. <laughs> yeah, Sardinia. I've got a good friend of mine, Alex, who's presenting at ChaiCon this October on a what's what we're calling a modified ketogenic diet to help restore mitochondria in basically every sick patient. And he's presenting on on how to do that and looking at the genetics and, and how to modify the ketogenic diet because the ketogenic diet is pretty extreme. So we wanna do a modified ketogenic diet for those who have mitochondrial disorders and dysfunction because they do it does very, very well. But he's hanging out in Sardinia now until the end of this month. So I wish I could crack the whip to get his slide presentation done, but I'm confident he'll do a good job. Um, but let me show you something else here. What was I gonna show you? This, this is a presentation I'm working on here for October. Where is it? This is a great thing to think about. Okay, I, this is not, you guys are seeing the whole finished slide here, because, but the foundation, the foundation of your patients is the epigenetics. It's the lifestyle, it's the diet, it's the environmental exposures and so on, okay? and what they're eating, what they're living, how much water they're drinking, so on, okay? Their, their love, their family. You cannot do anything with their epigenetics outside of basic lifestyle habits of eating, sleeping, drinking, and what they're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis and who they're around without addressing the foundation. That's the foundation, how they're breathing, how they're eating, how they're sleeping. That is critical. If you are dealing with SNPs and SNPs first, that's up here. That's where you handle SNPs. If you wanna optimize your patient, say they're an Olympian and they're just, they got a silver medal last year and they need to go a 10th of a second faster and they feel fantastic, that's way up here. That's optimal health. That's where we all wanna be the pinnacle. So we wanna, not focus on the SNPs. We got to get a solid foundation of our patients first. And how many of your patients have a solid foundation? How many are eating properly? How many are absorbing properly? How many have the love and the nurture that they need? How many are drinking the right fluids? And how many are eating healthy food? You can't find food, at least in this country anymore. There is no food. It's all garbage. So I was just talking with the, actually our banker today, and I told him when I got back from India, I, I was there in 1996. And when I was in Southeast Asia for five months, you go to the street, street vendors because it only costs like a nickel to have a meal. And if you go to a, a market, they have real food and you would get real vegetables and real meat and real grains and now, I, I, after I came back from India, I, I landed here. I went to Safeway. I got a shopping cart, and I went down the produce aisle. I picked a few things, and then I went down the whole middle of the store. I didn't find anything. And then I went to the meat aisle. I threw a couple things in, and I looked at my cart. It was basically empty, and I was frustrated because I couldn't find food. So our patient's foundation is, is very bad. So that's where we really, 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 really need to start. And this is a great summary right here. The lack of a phenotype consistency in both children points toward other genetic and environmental factors modifying the expression of the disease among individuals with the same genotype. What? The lack of consistency in your patients who are coming in with SNP reports of having MTHFR or COMT or MAO-A with different symptoms, and, but their 
genetics are the same, at least some of them on their report, say they're absolutely identical. They come in with different symptoms. Why? Because environmental factors and other genetic modifying the expression of that particular disease with the same genotype. Do you treat the SNPs? No, you treat the patient, you establish a foundation and you do everything that you're already doing. This is yet another tool. You use it appropriately, you see amazing things. Now, let me give you an ex amazing, I wanna leave the last 25 minutes here for questions because I wanna honor your time. But Dow A, or Dow, Dow SNP, diamine oxidase. This enzyme is very, very important to break down extracellular histamine. Extracellular histamine, meaning food-derived histamine or histamine from gut bacteria. I'm riddled with the Dow enzyme. I have it. And when I realized I was homozygous for three variants in the Dow uh, gene, and I looked at the literature, my lifestyle, my diet, my environment, I take supplements, uh, I rarely drink. I mean, I, I did everything pretty much to the nth degree, right? I would eat certain foods, I'd react. What the hell, what is it? I drink alcohol, some alcohol, red wine, I get nosebleeds like that from red, from red wine. High tyramine, Dow also breaks down amines. I started eliminating high histamine containing foods. Sorry for the graphicness here. I used to have prolific sweaty feet, no matter what. It was high histamine foods. I cut it out, gone. I don't have sweaty feet anymore. And that's a really graphic example, sorry. But I wanna show you and give you an example of where a SNP can really, really make a big difference. And the Dow was a big one for me. Identifying MT Chavar was a big one for me. I used to take folic acid. I never take folic acid anymore. I just don't take enriched foods. And I don't take folic acid supplements ever. So if I go to restaurants, I'm probably getting some folic acid. So, I, you know, it's impossible not to. So anyway, I hope that helps you guys out. Um, so, and I, what I want you guys to do from now on in the clinic, when patients come to you and they show you beef, be totally cool in how you, uh, I mean, state that you treat po genetic polymorphism, go for it, you do. Say that you identify them, you know them, you understand them, advertise the heck out of that, your website, okay? Do that all over the place. That attracts the patients to come to you. But what you need to understand is you need to go there last or, or look at them, I shouldn't say last, but approach them gingerly and not in isolation. You got to add that to everything. My desk is a mess. I've got new diagrams that I'm drawing out here. I've got another one. I've got note cards. I mean, I'm doing all these different things to try to put it out on maps for you. But my point is advertise that you do treat SNPs, but make sure that you uh, understand with your, and tell your patients that that they understand what this is. These things are what really, really controls the gene. And also point this out. And this is a PubMed ID. You can go to this paper and pull it. Put this on your poster or translate this into something and make that your own quote. But my point is, please don't treat the SNPs, treat the whole patient. Let's answer some questions. Oh. One more pet peeve, one more pet peeve. Patients are coming to you and say, hey doc, I've got COMT, MAUE, MTGFR, DAO, and PEMT. What supplements should I take? What do you say? Okay, you, 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 you say, well, we gotta go over your history. We gotta see if, if those genes are even a problem and say that we all have genetic polymorphisms. We all have genetic variation, every single one of us. We all are mutants, we all have SNPs. We all have to understand how they're being affected. And once we look at your history, once we understand what we can do in your lifestyle and your diet and your environment and your exposures, then we can see if these being a factor, okay? And some, maybe if they have Dow's, Dow SNPs, say, yeah, we need to look, reduce your high histamine foods right now. Right, we we gotta we gotta lower them now. There's some SNPs that you do take action on, and I'm I'm learning which ones, and uh, 
trying to make it proactive, but I'm too busy doing other things at the moment. So uh, let's get some questions here. I'm going to scroll up to honor those who answered. So uh, no notes for this webinar. Sorry. Uh, looking forward to the conference in October. I've got a 16-year-old female patient, 677 homo, was seeing another doc. She was told to avoid all folate, B12, not just supplements, but in food too. I found that a little startling. Any reason for this recommendation? Uh, yeah, a doctor who is, um, well, I don't, I, I'm jumping to conclusions, Pamela, but what I will say is, She may have turned in a, a genetic profile from these various genetic things, and maybe she had COMT, right? And there's a lot of problems with COMT uh, and misinformation. Maybe she has CBS, and there's a lot of information, misinformation on that. And I've got this, uh, let me show you this here. I want you guys all to use this resource. It's freely available. If you go to seekingout.org, there's this video here. It's an, it's an hour and a half video, and it gives you a lot of good information. If Some have already, have already seen it. But I want to show you here is if you go to YouTube, there's all these different videos. And I got here from seekingout.org. I clicked the YouTube channel, and what I want to show you is this COMT video. Actually, there's right here, COMT, what's the big deal? Okay, a lot of these are brand new, and uh, so you can just watch these and get for more information, okay? So doctors aren't treating SNPs right. So they looked at this, I don't know what they did here, but if I do agree that you have to be careful with, with methylfolate and methylcobalamin, because if you start with those two powerful nutrients, you can cause problems, especially if your patients are nice and efficient. And I've got new research now that looks at uh, PARP1, um, and it's a, it's a very cool gene which senses DNA oxidative damage, so DNA damage. So this gene's job is to identify DNA damage inside the bone marrow, and the bone marrow is very low in niacin, just doesn't store niacin very much down there are in there. So if you're pushing a bunch of B12 and folate to your patients, what's happening to the bone marrow? It's pumping out a new bunch of new red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, right? Just cranking them out. And you are possibly increasing DNA damage uh, at the same time. And if the patients are low in niacin, then if the, when the DNA damage is occurring, it's not being recognized and you're increasing the DNA damage, which is increasing the oxidative stress and apoptosis and or cellular necrosis, and it's causing this flood of negative reactions. You give niacin to your patients, this enzyme will wake up, start sensing the DNA damage, and start triggering these repair mechanisms to occur. So that's also another reason why niacin is so useful uh, for one of the many, many mechanisms for niacin for uh, treating your patients who have methylfolate side effects because it increases the DNA damage uh, sensory. And that's what the BRCA enzyme uh, gene also does. It BR, so the breast cancer gene, its job is to sense DNA damage. That's what it does. So anyway, another question. Um, to your knowledge, is there a relationship between CBS SNPs and Lyme disease? No, there's not a relation between CBS and Lyme disease. Uh, CBS SNP, I need to do a whole webinar on CBS. Maybe I'll do that next next month. Um, so I think I will. I think I will address CBS. Uh, you guys down for that? Doing a CBS uh, webinar next month? Okay, well, anyway, you can let me know by the uh, critiques or whatever, the reviews after this webinar. Um, CBS is, is not approached properly. And I brought this up in past webinars too, which are found in the Learning Center here at uh, seeingout.org. So seeingout.org in the Learning Center, it's a resource, um, or actually you go to your dashboard, sorry, you go to your dashboard and you see them here. Click to here, you view your webinars and they're all there. And you have to be a member in order to see those. And a membership is very, very inexpensive 
it's like, uh, I think it's $300 a year or something. Yeah. For health professional medical students, 25 bucks for you. Okay. I want you guys to learn this stuff. You've got 14 hours of different videos and so on. You get 5% of off online courses. You get all the recordings of the webinars and so on. Um, um, how do I help a patient with 677 hetero and CBS homozygous? Mike, if I could whack you from here, I would. <laughs> we don't address SNPs. We address our patients. Uh, I see this a lot and no fault to you. Uh, this is, patients are doing this to you. There's other doctors training you to do this. There's other health professionals training you to do this. But we don't tr treat the SNPs in isolation. You, what I want to start seeing is I have a patient who's 37 years old and they have allergies to this med. They've got a family history of heart disease and neurological disorders, and they live in a very toxic environment, exposed to mold. They're niacin deficient, B12 deficient, have lead mercury exposure, and they have a high stress job. They sleep four hours a night and they're dehydrated because they're not drinking enough alcohol. Uh, you know, alcohol. Yeah, there we go. Uh, they're not drinking enough water and so on. So you give a brief history like we we learned to do in med school that's what we used to do a basic you know soap note so you give a brief soap note and then at the end of that soap note part of or actually in the in the assessment in the a you could you could put that you found mtfr and cbs in there but you got to give the subjective first you give the objective you give the assessment and you can give the plan so that's how we approach our patients we don't start with snips SNPs is not, it's not SOAP, no, it's not SIP, SNP, Subjective Objective Assessment Plan. It's Subjective Objective Assessment Plan. And in that is SNPs. So let's not, let's, let's, let's stop uh, starting these questions with SNPs because I'm always going to look at you and I'm going to say, what's the lifestyle, what's the diet, what's, what's, what's the history? Because, uh, you know, if this patient was in Italy and they're fine. I'm going to say, well, they're fine. Don't worry about it. Just keep an eye on it. Um, when there are multiple SNPs within many different options, say there are 10 different SALT genes, how do you know which are significant up or down regulators? How many must be affected to see impact? Alex, fantastic question. Um, we don't really at this point. What I would say is if you see, if you get a, those 40 some odd page reports and there's a bunch of red, in a particular gene like GAD, and you type in that RSID in PubMed, or you look at SNPpedia, or you're looking everywhere, you're looking in your, I mean, all over the place, and you're not seeing any clinical data, but your patient's sensitive to MSG, and they're irritable and angry, they get headaches, they get migraines, and you give them magnesium and B6, and they start doing well, then they've got GAD issues. But glutamate has a lot of issues. There's there's a lot of reasons for elevated glutamate. It could be because glutamate is stored in vesicles in the brain, and when there's oxidative stress, uh, these vesicles are they break and their glutamate releases, and then calcium floods in, and, and homocysteine increases glutamate as well. So there's a lot of reasons for this. But if 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 you look at glutamate, at GAD genes, for example, so I I know you talked about salt, and salt is a big one too. But I want to talk about GAD because it's simple. So GAD is a glutamate decarboxylase, and what it does is it gets rid of glutamate in the brain and it turns it into GABA. Cofactors are B6, and magnesium plays a role as well. So And so does niacin and in a different spot. But if your patient has a bunch of red GAD, homozygous for GAD SNPs, and you can't tell if there's clinical relevance in the research or not, um, but you see it in the patient, then you say, look, you're susceptible to having high glutamate. And if they're tossing and turning and not able to have a sound sleep, they get headaches, they're irritable. Um, you know, they're just, they just, they can't tolerate high glutamate containing foods, i.e. wheat and soy, uh, MSG. And you give them magnesium B6 and they avoid these things and they do great. Then, yeah, you've got, you've got an issue there. And what is happening is, remember, enzymes do work. Enzymes have shapes. We can't see them, but they have shapes. And let's say, let's look at a, a wheelbarrow. Let's say the wheelbarrow, let go back to my landscaping days. 
uh, a wheelbarrow has got two handles. It's got a wheel. It's got things which uh, keep it stable on the ground. And it's got a tire in the front, which is hopefully pumped up. And now that wheelbarrow, if you got a cracked handle, it can still work. We can say that's one GAD snip. Now you got another GAD snip. So we got two homozygous GAD snip. And you've got a, a crack in the main bucket of the wheelbarrow. It still works. Now you got a third GAD snip and the other handle cracks. And now you can't load the wheelbarrow quite as much with gravel. So you, you, got, you can only load it with a little bit more gravel, uh, you know, say half full. Because if you load it too full, it's going to crack. Now you've got a fourth GAD snip. Its fourth one is red. And now the tire is kind of flat. Now that now you've got less in the, in the bin, and it's harder to wheel the thing. So now you have to carry even less. And so on and so on. So you've got this capacity, right? Think of it as the ability to do work. If you see a lot of red, the ability to do work is changing. Now, some of these GAD SNPs or any SNP can increase the function of the enzyme. So it possibly can increase the affinity of the cofactor binding. Some of them can decrease the cofactor binding. And we don't know enough yet. It's too new. So we don't know what's going on with the binding affinity of, of these shape changes. But these enzymes have specific shapes. The cofactor binds and the shape changes again when that shape change happens maybe you get a contraction maybe your muscle contracts maybe you, maybe your pupil contracts in your patient so these these different enzymes will have a purpose okay so i would look at uh it's a fantastic question i would look at the the number of them and also look at look at it in categories so let me pull this up so here's folate okay here's a folate pathway so if 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 your patient is just not doing well and they have MTHFR, homozygous, they have MTHFD1, homozygous, MTHFS, homozygous, HFT1, homozygous, DHFR, homozygous, and full R2 and full R1, homozygous. Now we've got major folate issues. Do you know clinical relevance on any of these? Maybe it's an MTHFR variant that you don't know. Maybe it's not 677, but something else. Now you can say, man, your whole folate pathway is really clogged up. And, or maybe they're working faster, but you know the folate pathway is, is not right. So you look at the pathway and the different genes and you say, okay, we need to start really looking at these things and you've got to be avoiding folic acid. You, you just can't take folic acid anymore. All your patients should not be taking folic acid. And I've, in the part one conference, uh, which I have have recorded at SeekingHealth.org, I talk about folic acid metabolism heavily. Okay, let me ask another question, answer another question here. Um, how difficult is it to treat a CBS SNP? Karen, I think you know the answer to that. We don't treat CBS SNPs, we treat patients. And where do you start? You start by going to seeingout.org and you can watch that uh, presentation. It's, it's no cost at all to you. It's fun to figure out the puzzle and cure the incurable. Yes, it is, Jess. Yes, it is. When working on methylation, do you give the majority of people phosphatidylcholine to take the burden off SAM so you can address the other methyl transferases? If so, what should we look so far uh, as milligram in different types? Jennifer, that is a great question. Um, so that for a lot of people who don't that's it's a pretty advanced question somewhat advanced question uh, i address it here in this video um, uh, right here the practical application but what i will say is sami 70 percent of sami in your patient is utilized for two things so actually we would probably say 90 percent of it's used for two things uh, since if you put them in combination to make creatine for muscles and uh, phosphatidylcholine for cell membranes. So there's a jillion cells in our human body and creatine, we pee it out on a daily basis uh, through our kidneys. So we have to keep refueling our creatine and we have to keep refueling our phosphatidylcholine for our cell membranes. And if we don't do that, our cell membranes are gonna be in trouble. And our creatine is also needed for various other pathways as well 
Uh, speech delay is a, is a big one for, for creatine. Um, to answer your dose question, it's very hard to answer dose questions. Um, I always start low and work up. Uh, that's my dose response. And uh, what I'm trying to do with Seeking Health is I'm trying to make it possible so you guys can start low and work up. You know, the tyrosine, for example, is commonly put, found in 500 milligram capsules. We have a 50 milligram lozenge. And I do that so you can start low and you can put it in the patient's mouth and you can see if they respond to that 50 milligrams of tyrosine right away. If they swallow the capsule and it's 500 milligrams, you can be making them agitated, pissed off, anxious, uh, heart rate uh, increase, sweating. Um, you know, it's just not good and you can't do anything. But if you give them a lozenge or a liquid or a little bit at a time, you can figure out what that dosage is, and then you can give the amount needed. So with phosphatidylcholine, what I would do is I would give a liquid phosphatidylcholine and just give a little bit at a time. And if you do that, then you're going to be able to see what it's going to, your patient's going to need. Now, keep in mind that it's all about the ability to do work for, for these things. So if your patient is very, very ill, and you give phosphatidylcholine, which is a fat, they might need some liver support first. They might need some milk thistle and taurine, uh, impossible glycine uh, to help with the bile salts, or maybe they'll just need some ox bile to help absorb phosphatidylcholine. So if you ask them, do you tolerate fats? And they, and they say, no, I get diarrhea, or my gallbladder is removed, and you give them phosphatidylcholine, and say you give them too much, then they could, they could get diarrhea from it. So start low and work up. Um, but the, the premise for your question uh, to help other people is, um, and it's also in the video, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, is, is if, you, if the main purpose of SAMe, let's go here. The main purpose of SAMe is to make phosphatidylcholine and creatine. These are the two enzymes which do it, phosphatidylcholine ethanolamine or phosphatidylethanolamine methyltransferase and guanidoacetate methyltransferase. Can't believe I still remember that. That's pretty dorky. Uh, so 70% of SAMe utilization goes just to these two enzymes. And there are genetic polymorphisms, i.e. SNPs, in these two genes. If you see red PEMT in your patient and red GAMT in your patient, that's very clinically significant, very clinically significant. So again, Approaching SNPs, you need to understand which are very significant and must be taken action upon first, and which ones you need to really uh, approach more slowly and gingerly. And this is this is all pioneering. So having you guys all here on the call with me today is is, is very um, very thankful for that, honestly, because you guys are in the trenches, literally. And, you know, I'm in the planning booth here trying to figure stuff out. But in the trenches, you guys are giving these nutrients to your patients with these various SNPs. And when you give me feedback and say, look, I gave phosphatidylcholine and creatine to, your pa to my patient, and it really made a significant impact without any side effects, that's phenomenal. Um, and if you go come back to me, they have side effects, and this was the side effects, then I can look at my pathways and say, okay, why was that? And I can come up with reasons why that occurred. So having you guys give me input back is, is very important um, because I'm not applying it on patients, but I am indirectly via you guys and gals. So I want to say thank you guys, uh, for that. Um, but to go back in point, I have a lot of tangents because every every comment is, 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 is loaded. Um, I see algorithms in my head pointing in many different directions. So if you see PEMT, there are clinically relevant SNPs here. Phosphatidylcholine is important, and GAMT is really important. Actually, uh, Children's Hospital and Mayo Clinic are very familiar with uh, – yeah, go ahead. Um, this is my son, Theo, asking for my cell phone. Um, so kids with speech delay, I'm very passionate about optimizing kids' health makes it easier on your parents, makes kids uh, have a great childhood um, or improved childhood. So speech delay is common in, in children with, with methylation dysfunction and GAMT uh, polymorphisms. Uh, random question, maybe not the right time now for this, but would I say methylmonic acid is a good enough cellular marker for B12 status? Uh, Carl, that's a fantastic question. Um, 
holotranscobalamin in combination with methylmonic acid, I think is a is a is a is a better uh, status. Looking at MCV, MCH is also important. Looking at glutathione is also important because if the glutathione is is not uh, adequate, then the B12 isn't going to be carried properly. Um, so that's that's important. Um, uh, so I have a patient who's homozygous for both MTR and MTRR and profound B12 deficiency in history of homocysteine uh, of 22, amongst other things. That is a great question. So Carl gave some history. He gave some uh, subjective stuff, objective stuff, uh, a little bit of a plan, and some sniffs. It's all there. So that is a great question. It's all there. Um, and he was wondering about how to identify and see where the hook hangups are because MTR, MTRR utilize methylcobalamin, right? So methylcobalamin, the homocysteine is elevated in this patient. There are known SNPs here and here in, in Carl's patient, and he wants to know if methylcobalamin is, is adequate in his patients. Um, but let me show you what methylmonic acid is, is doing. Um, so methylmonic acid is right here. So methylmonal CoA is where adenosylcobalamin comes into play. And adenosylcobalamin is the mitochondrial component, the mitochondrial form of B12. So if the methylmonic acid in your patient is elevated and they're taking, uh, guys, see, sorry, <laughs> there's so many ifs, ands, buts, it's, it's annoying. Uh, sorry, it's not easy. Adenosylcobalamin is what will lower methylmonic acid. So if your patients will come in with elevated MMA and you give adenosylcobalamin, it will transform that methylmonic A into succinyl K, CoA and it will go into the citric acid cycle and do its thing. Now, if you gave methylmonic acid to the patient, i sorry, <laughs> you would not do that. If you gave methylcobalamin to your patient, there are known enzymatic problems in SNPs which transform methylcobalamin to adenosylcobalamin, and that is going through a, a gene called MMAB, and I'm still learning about that. Bernardo Zinker is also uh, looking at that as well. She's presenting this October. Uh, but what happens here is there is a problem between methylcobalamin transforming to adenosylcobalamin. So if you're giving your patient methylcobalamin and MMA is still staying elevated, your patient might have a problem in the ability to form adenosylcobalamin. So if that's the problem, then you give adenosylcobalamin, this form of B12, to your patient, and I almost guarantee that methylmonic acid will drop. So if once that drops, then the succinyl-CoA will start to increase and so on. Um, you can also get a succinyl-CoA increasing due to citric acid cycle feedback inhibitions, which then might come back and increase methylmonic CoA and even if in the adequate amounts of adenosylcobalamin. So this is what I'm studying on right now, this area. This is what October is really focusing on. I put the citric acid cycle with no information. Uh, now I'm doing things which are extremely mind-blowing. Uh, I want to, I'm really excited about this one slide. So let me close this and I want to show you guys. I'm going to give you a little peekaboo view into what, uh, October is going to do here. Yeah, we got 224 slides so far and counting. Breath. Breath is pretty important. Pseudohypoxia. You guys know what pseudohypoxia means? Your patient's got enough, their blood PO, uh, PO2 level is just fine. So their, their oxygen level is just fine, but they're hypoxic. They're not getting oxygen to the tissues. So how do you figure that out? You'll learn this October. It's pretty cool. I want to show you something here. Where is it? Come on. This slide. Yes. Okay. This slide 
is amazing. This paper is amazing. It's free. Type in this PubMed. Go ahead and write it down now. 250-19091. And this paper is phenomenal. It's, it's, it's really, 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 really good. Now, your patients eat. They eat, right? They all eat. What do they eat is important. What happens when they eat too much is important. Diabetics are all over the place. A lot of your patients are diabetics. So what happens? Why are diabetics so traumatized? Why are their eyes screwed up? Why are their ulcers not heal? Why do they get cardiovascular disease? Why are they tired? And why, is there, why are they insulin resistant? And why are they more cancer prone? Why are they just so screwed? I mean, literally. So glucose, once the cell has enough NADH, once the cell has enough fuel, and they're still eating, the glucose has got to go somewhere. It's got to go somewhere. So the Krebs cycle gets inhibited. It's inhibited. It's shut down. So this, this intermediate, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, accumulates, and it needs to go somewhere. Where does it go? It goes down all these alternate pathways, which do what? Increase reactive oxygen species. Down all these polyol pathways, hexosamine pathway, methylglyoxal pathways, uh, the uh, alpha-ketoaldehyde pathway, um, dihydroxyacetone pathway. You ever learn these things in med school? No, we didn't learn any of this stuff. I didn't learn any of this stuff. This is phenomenal. And fructose, fructose corn syrup, right? Or it's terrible. So our patients, when they eat too much and they eat too much carbohydrate or they're diabetic or they're insulin resistant or, or whatever is happening, the Krebs cycle gets inhibited and all these reactive oxygen species start accumulating. And now you've got massive mitochondrial dysfunction. The glutathione gets depleted. Now their cell membranes get destroyed and now they're more fatigued and now they got neurological disorders. They've got, uh, you know, cardiovascular disorders and now they've got every disorder under the sun and it's, it's all because they're not eating right. It's that simple or they're not drinking enough water, or they're not breathing properly. Breath, I mean, it's, it's so critically important. And I'm sitting here in a desk. My desk actually goes up and down. I have a stand-up desk, so I stand a lot uh, when I work. And I have an anti-fatigue mat that I put my feet on as well. So these basic things, you sit all day at a keyboard, you're hunched forward, you can't breathe. You can't breathe. You're not getting oxygen in the tissues. If you're stressed out, you're hyperventilating. If you're hyperventilating, you're getting the bore effect. What's the bore effect? You learn this October. What's it, how does it affect your patient? Significantly. So it's, it's, I'm really excited about this conference in October, and I want you guys to be successful clinically. I want you guys to understand how to treat SNPs and what the SNPs do. But really, SNPs is not where we need to be focusing right now. If you look at the part one conference, I was all about SNPs. The part two conference, I touched on epigenetics and I addressed more SNPs. This is kind of the part three conference. And I realized that we are diving in way too deep. We're not hitting the foundation of our patients. If we're not hitting the foundation for our patients, how they're breathing, how they're drinking, how they're eating, how they're sleeping, how their environment is, we're missing the boat. And uh, so I'm giving you the hardcore science. I mean, this stuff is, is, is amazing. Uh, I mean, we've got hyperglycemic pseudo hypoxia. Uh, I mean, um, your, your patient uh, is exercising. You got increased oxidative stress, which triggers nerf 2 which increases mitochondrial biogenesis. So you get more mitochondria so they can increase more ATP. So exercise is great, but if you exercise too much or if you give glutathione prior to exercise, you get no benefit. If your patient's taking too many antioxidants, you don't get the nerf 2 so you don't get the mitochondrial biogenesis, so your patients aren't making enough mitochondria. So now how do you balance it all? So this is, this is a very cool conference, and I want to see you guys there. And I'm, I've got a four-day venue going on. So you can learn more at signal.org. You hit the conference. We've got the agenda here, which is changing. Um, I brought in Alex because 
Alex from the UK, because what I, I, I did is I identified all this research, right? And I've, I've learned that the ketogenic diet is phenomenal, but a lot of patients can't handle the ketogenic diet for various reasons. And if you adapt, if you change the food your patient is eating because the food is causing more reactive oxygen species, how many of you hear your patients eating fat, protein, or carbs, and they feel worse after they eat? There's many reasons for it, but they're, they're, there's reasons which I'm going to teach you why it's happening. And now Alex is going to give you guys actionable plans of how to modify your patient's diet to improve their mitochondrial function. And if you prove their mitochondrial function, it's in the brain, eyes, uh, digestive systems, intestinal repair, uh, skin, muscles, it's mitochondria everywhere. And if the mitochondria are functioning, then the rest of the machinery can start working. And once that happens, the healing can, can result. So we have to start with food first and, and understanding what your patient should eat. And so I give the science of, of how the body works, why it gets broken, how to fix it. And then Alex is going to give you some clinical proof of really how to do it because he works with high-level athletes and uh, uses a ketogenic diet but modified in his own way. And he uses very objective data with monitoring heart rate variability and real-time data. If you, if you alter your patient's um, with lifestyle or nutrient recommendations or supplements or, or more exercise or less exercise, more sleep. He teaches you how to give, uh, utilize like heart rate variabilities and other real time data. And it goes in your patient's phone and you can see it and track it over time. And they can say, Oh, I took methylfolate here. Look at my heart rate variability. It, it went way up or it went way down. And you can say, okay, well, you know, there and you start getting this data without having to spend expensive uh, time consuming labs. You got real time hardcore data that you can track. It's 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 really, really cool. So thank you, Alex, for your your work. It's it's uh, going to be really making it easier for you guys. So come to seeingout.org, click the conference. The registration is here. Uh, so it's a four day conference. And if you can't make it, you can choose the uh, various days, three day, two day, or one day pass. And it's in Denver, Colorado. Uh, students and first year graduates, uh, I wanna say, you know, I wanna get you guys there, $650. It's basically half the price for, for full purchase of the conference, four days is $1,295. Financial scholarship, if you cannot afford the $1,295, you pay the $895. You select $895 and that's good. My company will pay the difference. I want to see you guys there. I want to see this actionable. Okay. So if you click over this, it says available to anyone needing assistance. And that doesn't matter. If you need assistance, flights are expensive. Hotels are expensive. We're feeding you breakfast and lunch. So dinners are on your own. But uh, uh, this is cool. This is a great conference. And the networking is going to be good too because when you guys are having lunches, you don't, I'm not having exhibitors sit there and, and bark at you and shield their supplements and their wares. When you sit down for lunch, just sit down for lunch and you talk with your colleagues and your uh, future networking buddies and you make some significant impact and you learn during your lunch times. You don't get promoted product. So uh, that's very, very important to me because I hate going to conferences and sitting at a lunch excited to talk to people like Alex or these new people that I've met who are doing amazing things. And I can't talk to them because I'm, I'm listening to some guy talk about how great his snake oil is. It's annoying. We don't do that. So, and it's also money back guaranteed. So that's enough. That's enough self-promotion of the conference, but it's really, this conference is about you guys. And uh, again, it's hundred percent guaranteed. If you don't like it, Email us back. We'll refund you. It's that simple. Uh, I think this stuff is mind blowing. Uh, I think it's very changing. And I received an email today from uh, Ann Johnson, who's been utilizing our work. Thank you, Ann. Uh, she had a, a patient who was struggling for a long, long time. And she utilized the pathway planner and the genetics and the, the whole gamut and all the teachings. And she, she basically identified where on the pathway problem was and it was arginine and she prepared the patient to take the arginine gave the arginine and transformed the patient 
got to be careful with arginine, but she knows that because I've already gave warning. Um, and I, I believe I read a paper and talked about arginine. Arginine deficiency and methionine deficiency is very common in pediatrics. And uh, arginine does a lot. I think that's one of my... Uh, one of my new pathways here. So you're going to see a new arginine pathway planner and uh, hypoxia planners, pseudo-hypoxia planners, uh, expanded pathway planners. Um, oh, decarboxylated SAMe. Woo, that's cool. Homocysteine thiolactone. Very cool as well. So SAMe, uh, cell defense mechanisms, uh, cell response mechanisms I'm also getting into. There's reasons why our body does everything. Uh, it doesn't cause cancer for because it wants to kill you. It's actually trying to preserve you, um, but it got out of hand because of a hypoxic environment. So it's all there. Hope to see you this October. And if I don't, I hope to see you at some point. And thank you again very, 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 very much for uh, your interest in this field of medicine because this is transforming people and including making doctors more successful in their practice, which is good for everybody. Thanks again. See you next time.